2010 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board. There are seven members present. We have a quorum. The first item on our agenda would be to consider approval of the minutes of our previous meeting from June 15th, 2010. Do anybody that has any questions, comments, thoughts, or suggestions on the uh, minutes? Barbara. Move to accept the minutes. Second. Motion having been made by Barbara Schenkel and seconded by was it Elaine or Elaine Valander. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion? Motion carries 7-0. Uh, first item of business we have tonight is the Portland Water District South Cape Pump Station Upgrade Resource Protection Permit. I'm hoping we have an applicant here who can step up to the microphone and make their presentation. The uh, South Portland Water District is requesting a resource protection permit for an upgrade to the Southern Main Pump Station located on Sperwink Avenue for work such as new piping, underground electri electrical conduit, a new utility pole, and paving within the RP1 buffer. Section 3 resource protection, completeness, and public hearing. We're still warming up, so we'll take a moment. <laughs> Well, we have a second, Peter, just in the interest of full disclosure, I both hired Bright Pierce and worked for them on projects, and I have no trouble being objective in all this. Any, any other board member feel differently? I don't, I don't really see a problem. I don't, I don't either. Thank you, Jim, for that disclosure. go with a paper copy, the backup, sorry. I had the uh, flash drive, but I must have the wrong one with me this evening. I'll, hold, I'll bring that up. Uh, my name is Chris Lionel. I work for Wright Pierce Engineers. I'm here this evening representing the Portland Water District. Uh, Ron Miller, the general manager from the Portland Water District, is here this evening as well. Um, we, the applicant, Portland Water District, is applying for a resource protection permit um, to construct public utilities within the 250-foot buffer zone of the RP1 zone uh, located along the Spurwink River um, off of Spurwink Avenue. Um, the um, information, uh, you have information that was submitted to you on behalf of the project. The district owns and operates a 500,000 gallon per day wastewater treatment facility um, located on Spurwink Avenue as well as a pump station. It serves the southern part of uh, Cape Elizabeth. Uh, currently, the facilities have pumps that operate during wet weather to pump untreated effluent uh, into the effluent force main or effluent pipe from the facility uh, that goes untreated into uh, People's Cove. Uh, the main Department of Environmental Protection um, has required the Portland Water District to uh, ultimately eliminate, but if not mitigate, the amount of water that gets pumped into People's Cove um, during wet weather periods, uh, hence the need for the existing project uh, before you. The project schedule is re they're required the project to begin construction in September of this year and be substantially complete in September of next year. Um, the improvements as detailed in the application in, in the work that's involved within the 250 foot buffer zone uh, includes uh, new piping, uh, new six inch pipe, underground pipe, some underground electrical conduit and wires, um, a new power pole and transformer, 
an underground concrete vault that's approximately 8 feet by 10 feet that will include some piping and valves and a flow meter um, and an ex a new 12-foot um, wide driveway um, to be able to provide the district better access to the uh, existing uh, facilities that are there for heavy equipment for pump out of uh, various grease and whatnot, um, and in a small extension to an existing gravel driveway. The total new impervious area is about 850 uh, square feet. Um, the purpose again of the project is to be able to provide facilities to minimize the amount of flow going uh, out into Peebles Cove untreated and to be able to pump that additional uh, basically infiltration inflow groundwater and other stuff that gets into the existing collection pipes and to be able to pump that to the treatment plant and actually provide treatment for it in lieu of it going untreated during wet weather to the people's cove area um, I think that about summarizes uh, the projects and I'm certainly here to answer any questions you have on the application or the project there is a copy within your packet you have a copy of this same map here so Apologize for not having a larger version. So the uh, first item we're work to consider tonight is the issue of completeness, and uh, I'd open up the floor to questions from the board about whether they think there's any information that we should be uh, provided in order to consider the application. I have a motion. Go ahead, Elaine. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the Portland Water District for resource protection permit to construct upgrades required by the main DEP at the Southern Cape Pump Station located on Spurwink Avenue be deemed complete. Second. Motion ha a motion having been made by Elaine Fallender and seconded by Barbara Schenkel. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion for completeness? Motion carries 7 nothing. Next item we have is uh, to consider approval of the plan. Does the applicant have any further presentation that they wish to make? Uh, not at this time. Again, available to answer any questions that you have. Sure. Hearing none, what I'd like to do is open up the public hearing and invite anyone wishing to come up to speak concerning this application of the South uh, Portland Water District for the South Cape Pump Station upgrade to come up to the podium, introduce yourself, and give your comments to the board, and we'll consider them. Going once, going twice. The hot item. <laughs> <laughs> hearing none, I'd like to close the public hearing and open up the floor to comments from the planning board, town planner, or anyone else that wishes to have any questions, comments, thoughts, or suggestions. Do you have any comments on Steve Harding's letter, or are you basically comfortable with his observations? Uh, comfortable with his, with his observations, and I've already talked to representatives from the district about making some, perhaps some slight adjustments uh, to things at the site. Um, won't change anything of the impervious area. If anything, it would go down. Um, the only thing that was in his letter that I wanted to look into in greater detail was his suggestion that there might um, need to be some NERPA permitting through the state. And that's primarily because we've added a small gravel driveway at CMP's request to be able to allow them to get to a new power pole with the transformer that we're putting on it. So uh, over the next week or so, we'll be talking with them about the possibility of moving that pole because we really don't, the district's not interested in doing any, any wetlands permitting as part of the project. So I think ideally, ultimately what we'll do is be able to pull everything outside. We're just barely into that 75-foot setback that... Uh, the state requires. Um, as far as his additional comments on his letter here. If you do end up moving that poll, would that change the plans that we're approving tonight? And if um, we, we need to make provision to allow that. Actually, the poll itself is not within the buffer zone. No, it's just if, a small amount. Of the if you could put that up on the uh, board, because yeah, we're, because we're broadcasting this, yes. and, I, and I know that allows it to be uh, Send on over the airwaves a lot easier. Yes. Thank you. Um, here's the pump station location here. Here is the um, wetland upland edge as determined by uh, with, uh, sitting with or going over with the code enforcement officer here. Um, and it's this little bit of gravel that we've added right here that actually just barely gets within the 75 foot setback. Um, so I don't. I think the pole is outside of that. So likely, what we 
would do is maybe look to change the orientation of the driveway or even possibly talk to CMP about eliminating that gravel altogether um, just to avoid the need to do permitting. So um, I, don't, I, I can't say if we'll, we'll change it at this point. I probably need to make, make, a, make a call to Maine DEP too to talk to them about it as well. Um, but um, I think we're going if, to, if I guess the question that I have is if we do make a slight change to that plan by getting the gravel further away from the resource, um, what would be the, is there a need to come back to submit a change? Or, um, I believe there might be unless we anticipate that now and give you the flexibility to do that within some accepted guidelines. You want to do it that way rather or you know. The ordinance says any change to the plan needs to come back to the planning board. So you're either <clears throat> telling them it's okay to make changes without coming back to the board, do you really want to set that precedent? No. Or you create a condition that anticipates some adjustments so that you actually know about it. I suggest we make, we, I suggest that we create a condition that will allow them to rotate it. I mean, it seems ridiculous to come back here. It's such a minor change anyway. Yeah. And, and if CMP is willing and we want it, it. and it works for the town, it seems to me we should make a condition that says they can either eliminate that small gravel area or rotate it in such a way that it will not enter. To get it for, really further away, further from, away, the, further from, away the from the resource. 75 foot setback. Aside from that, I had no other uh, questions or concerns on the uh, letter from uh, Steve Harding. So you want to uh, adjust the gravel area and or reposition the driveway? And it may, re it may require some slight adjustments to the actual pole location. If we move the driveway, we might need to move the pole to just be able to align them so that they can essentially back right up to the pole with trucks. But again, getting those you know, so that they're further away from the resource. And Chris, you end up just doing this with as-builts, or how would you really do it? Actually, we have a, we had a, uh, I meant to mention it, we had a pre-bid meeting for the construction project today to yeah. allow the contractors to see the, to see the, the project and to see the site. Um, and bids are due actually two weeks from today uh, on the project to try to meet that September deadline. Uh, we, so we have some time between now and the bid opening to issue an addendum uh, to the contract documents, would, which would essentially be able to make this change uh, by addendums that are sent to the contractor. So I would try to do it in that, in that framework. Um, and probably, it probably wouldn't involve reissuing this drawing at this time. It right. probably verbally described to the contractor. And then as part of the as-built drawings on the job, yeah. we would reflect that change. You're okay. absolutely right. So those would be uh, Bob Malley to get a copy of those, and they'd be on and file. Oh, yeah. He knows 20 yeah. years why we did it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll be under contract to, to provide as-built drawings to the Portland Water District um, as part of our construction phase services. So, okay. yes, I mean, those would be available certainly to Bob. Anyone else? I just have one question, right. and that is the, the Conservation Community Commission strongly recommends that the applicant minimize the amount of vegetation to be removed, and I, I'm assuming you're putting this in, in your... Yeah, we were, we were actually looking at that uh, today when we were out on the site. Um, it looks like the only area that there might be a few, looks like sumac trees uh, that have grown up is, is in, the, in the location here, which is just at the edge of the resource protection zone. Um, there's a couple of large trees here, which obviously the district wants to maintain, a large oak tree and a large pine tree over here. But there's some small shrubs that um, may be right on the edge of where the contractor would be working that may need to be thinned back a little. But um, every, you know, I, I believe that that pipe route actually is right on a grassy area where there's no, and that'll just be restored back with grass after the fact. Aside of that, this is all just grass and fields here. There won't be any, any vegetation removed. There will be, and then it will be restored to existing conditions. Any sumac you cut down is going to be back in two weeks anyway. So. I know. <laughs> well, it's also, uh, it, certainly from an uh, underground pipeline perspective, it's not good to have vegetation, large trees growing on top of pipes because the roots can go into them and uh, affect their integrity. So the district may want to do a little bit of thinning of some very light brush and sumax just to prevent damage to the pipes and expense down the road. But I think it's going to be very minor, and the district understands 
they they like being hidden the way that they are right now and not 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 being seen from the road. So. Any other questions, Barbara? You all set? I'm all set. Motion. I'm re I'm ready for motion. Motion for approval. Findings of fact. The Portland Water District is proposing upgrades required by the main DEP at the Southern Cape Pump Station located on Spurwink Ave, which require review under Section 19-8-3 Resource Protection Permit. Two, the town engineer is recommending revisions to the plans. Three, the application substantially complies with Section 19-8-3 Resource Protection Regulations. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the Portland Water District for a resource protection permit to construct upgrades required by the main DEP at the Southern Cape Pump Station located on Spurwink Avenue be approved subject to the following conditions. One, that the plans be revised per the town engineer's letter dated July 13, 2010. Two, that the applicant obtain any required state or federal permits to commit prior to the commencement of construction. Three, and this is a new one I'm, I'm adding for whoever's taking minutes down there, um, that the applicant um, shall be permitted to make minor adjustments in the location of the graveled area, the positioning of the driveway, or the location of the utility pole, provided that um, no such changes have any material adverse impact on the wetland area, and for that there be no alteration of the site or issuance of a building permit until the above conditions have been met. I'm going to hold just a minute to make sure Maureen got that text down. You all set? Okay, a motion having been made. I hear a second. I, I might amend that location to one that's um, outside of the 75 foot buffer. Is that, is that okay? Yes. Okay. That's fine. So we move it the only for that condition. The Both pole. the pole, the transformer, okay. and the gravel driveway. But the driveway actually Excuse may me. remain within the buffer, is that, is that right? right? Yeah. It's just the pole just would the pole. possibly be outside the buffer. Um, I mean, it's it. I, I don't, if we do try to relocate it and we still end up being within 75 feet, Cause you're in we it. need to go get a, a probably just be a, a permit by rule, a very small permit required through Maine DEP. We're going we're gonna to obviously endeavor to make it 75 feet away so that we don't have to do the permitting. But should we still end up in that 75-foot location, I don't know if I want. Um, I'd, I'd certainly have to come back then um, if I can't get it outside 70 feet. So maybe just the adjustments to endeavor to get it outside, you know, further away from the resource will be sufficient. And if we're within the resource, we're going to go and get the permit that we need to get from Maine DEP. If we're still within the resource. Or 75 so if you're feet within from the it. resource, you may move it anyway. I'm sorry? If you're within the resource and you have to get the permit, you may want to move it anyway. Right. So you don't want the limitation of moving it yeah, only I don't want the if it's outside of the buffer. That I have to move it outside the 75-foot gotcha. okay. setback because I may not be able to and I may have to go get a state permit because I'm within 75 feet. You may have to move feet. it anyway. Okay. Then I think we should leave it as is then. Okay. So is that a second? No. Yeah. That's a second. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see one. Oof. A motion having been made by Elaine and seconded by Liza. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none. All those in favor of the motion? All those opposed? Motion carries 7 nothing. Thank you Thank so you. much. Next item on the agenda tonight is the Evergreen Memory Care Site Plan Amendment. Lon Walters is requesting an amendment to the previously approved site plan for the facility under construction at 126 Scott Dyer Road to change the name from Evergreen Memory Care to Cape Memory Care, Section 19-9, Site Plan Amendment. If the applicant could introduce themselves and make his presentation, we'll consider. Uh, You're my, up. Name is, my name is Lon Walters. Um, 
as you know, when we uh, initially submitted our application, um, we submitted it under the name Woodlands Assisted Living, since that's our corporate, that's the uh, legal entity uh, here in Cape Elizabeth. Um, and, but the planning board decided that um, that wasn't an acceptable name, and so we changed it to Evergreen Memory Care because that is the name of one of our other um, Alzheimer's facilities located in, in uh, Waterville. So it seemed logical if, if we couldn't use the Woodlands name that we would use the Evergreen name. And not being as familiar with the area as we obviously should have, we didn't, we didn't know that there was a nursing home in Saco called Evergreen. And that was an immediate you know, conflict problem for us in a business sense. And uh, so um, I had never, I had not met with the uh, fire chief directly. And, and I know it was, it was he that was the kind of the motivating factor, you know, for the name not being acceptable, the Woodlands name. Um, and, but I had not met with him. So I, I, knowing that we had to change the name, I, I went directly to him and spoke to him, hoping that I could persuade him to, uh, you know, allow us to use the Woodlands name. And, you know, we had a nice conversation and, you know, I didn't get very far with him. And, uh, so that was, that was good. So I went about trying to find a new name and, and came up with the name Cape Memory Care. And as soon as I came up with that name, I went back to the fire chief. Um, I sent him an email saying, this is the proposed change. Um, would that you know, be acceptable to you. And my understanding is he checked with the police chief and sent me an email back saying, you know, he, he saw no problem with that name. Um, and so, you know, we had already printed a lot of our stuff, a lot of our brochure materials and a lot of the stuff using Evergreen. So we, we trashed that out and, uh, you know, restarted going with the Cape name, um, you know, Perhaps you know we should have gone through this process first, but the the whole project, as you know, I mean, we we purchased the property in October last year. We're going to be open at the end of October this year, so we're on a very fast track. So, you know, that's my excuse, I guess. You know, if if uh, if I need an excuse, um, so that's where we're at um, right now, and. Uh, so that's it. I mean, I don't have much else to say about it. Okay. Um, so this is on for a site plan amendment. Do you have any proposed signage or anything like that that you can show us or? or I can't hear you very well. Do you well. have any proposed signage, you know, signs that you're going to be using for it? Signage? Right. Um, no, we haven't, we haven't done the signage yet. I mean, it's, we're going to do whatever, you know, we're going to abide by the setbacks and the sizes and the lighting and the, you know, whatever, whatever the ordinance is. You know, we don't have a, a set um, plan yet. It, and it, you know, it'll be located um, either according to what the, what the site plan says or I guess it'll have to be located there if it's shown on the plan. And it'll be according, whatever, whatever the ordinance is, I'm not... I don't know, I don't, off the top of my head, I don't know the exact size, you know, that's required, you know, the maximum size. Well, I guess the, the concern I had was the, uh, this, this name showed up on the site, and um, we wanted to make sure that the new sign has this name and only this name, and um, once, it goes, once it goes in and, it, and the building permit is, uh, I'm sorry, the occupancy permit is issued. In, um, in my concern? Hold on just a second. No, I, I want to segue after you. That's right. I just want to hear his answer first. Can you hear me? I'm not hearing very well, you know, the, the acoustics and everything. And, and when you're not, you're not coming through the mic very well. Well, I, my concern is that we're going to see Cape Memory Care and Cape Memory Care only on the new signage. Go ahead, Barbara. You have something you'd like to add to that? Well, I would because I, I think when I just like to clarify something for anybody that's here and anybody that might be listening. We did not arbitrarily say that we did not 
want you to have the name Woodlands. The problem was that we have a street named Woodlands. And that if, if you have a, when you have units for the elderly who are not well, you have many ambulances that go there. And if we have the same name, they're going to be going to the wrong place sometimes. So it wasn't an arbitrary decision. And I think what we're trying to say is that Kate Memory Care would probably be just fine with all of us without any Woodlands net mentioned on the sign. Because your co corporation is named Woodlands, this facility should be named Cape Memory Care. And that's what should be on the sign and nothing else. If I implied that your decision was arbitrary, I, I didn't Well, I'm just that. clarifying. I know, it was, I know it was the uh, fire chief's concern about just, just exactly what you're saying, which is a, you know, it's a reasonable, certainly a reasonable concern. But what we're saying here, I think, is are you prepared to have Cape Memory Care on your signs without the mention of the name Woodlands? Because right now, it seems the Woodlands is, and I think, Victoria, you picked that up and, and were concerned. The Woodlands name was fairly large on the sign. And it should, if it's going to be Cape Memory Care, it should be Cape Memory Care. The, um, that was a sign, that was a temporary construction sign, or a temporary sign that we had used on the last project. So rather than make an all-new sign, we just brought it over and replace the name of the last facility with the Cape Memory Care. That's why it looks like it did. It wasn't, you know, developed just for this, you know, project. Um, the, it is going to be Cape Memory Care. I mean, it's going to be listed in the phone book, and it's, you know, when people answer the phone, and when, you know, when we're out in the community, you know, we've already, you know, that's the name we're using. The other, the other thing about the Woodlands name, um, you know, we, we do have a, a, a presence, you know, in the state, um, in other locations. And when we go into a new community, like, like here, one of my people were out the other day doing a marketing type thing at one of the home health agencies. And when she went in, she gave the guy her card. And he said, oh, Woodlands, we, we service some of your facilities, you know, elsewhere. It's sort of a kind of a credibility um, letting us people know who we are, not, not to say that's the name of this facility, but just that it, 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 we're not just Cape Memory Care, this one little place, we're, we're something more than that, uh, other places. The, the thing that I would like to do uh, is, and I, I'll pass this around, I, don't I didn't make a lot of copies, uh, but this is, this is the Village Crossing sign down the street you know, just a couple doors down. And, you know, that's, that's the type of thing that I would see doing, just identifying that we're part of this other bigger, um, you, know, you know, bigger thing. Um, but yet, you know, we're not going to hold ourselves out as Woodlands Assisted Living. I mean, that's not what we're going to call ourselves. That's not what we're going to... You know, if I met you and, and, and you said, oh, well, what, what are you doing? I said, oh, I, you know, we're promoting Cape Memory Care. We're, you know, out, you know, talking about that. Um, so what, that's... What, what that's, I hear you saying is this, the sign may show up as, and I'm not saying this is good or bad, Cape Memory Care, you know, a Woodlands, blah, blah, blah. It would look, I mean, I would see it being something like that where you drive down the street... Mm -hmm. You know, you drive by that sign all the time. You see that sign, you have, you'd have to look twice, or you'd have to think about it before you would see the kindred part of it. You know, the, head, the banner will be Cape Memory Care, and then it will be, you know, a Woodlands Assisted Living part of the group, you know. And that's what we've done on our brochures sure. and our other marketing. In principle, I have no trouble with what you're doing. I guess my concern is I'd want to run that by the fire chief and police chief to make sure that whatever shows up there doesn't confuse anyone else. Right. Uh, and that, that's my only concern, because that's the reason where this name makes a difference. Mm -hmm. I don't want the emergency folks going to the wrong place. So I guess I'm inclined to approve the amendment, but reserving some review of the sign itself before the occupancy permit is issued. Because, and it, frankly, it's OK with the public safety folks. It's OK with me. Yeah. yeah. That's why I went to him first. I he was the guy that, 
But he, he's not passing on the fit of what it's going to look like. Eliza, do you have a okay. question? So I just wanted to say, first of all, you didn't imply that it was arbitrary. Barbara was just saying that for right. the public's benefit. Okay. So, um, and then also, I did take a job down by the Woodland 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 Street today, and there was a big sign, a big apartment complex, Woodland South. So that's you know a potential source of confusion. But um, I just am concerned of what may happen um, in practice. That it's um, if if the Woodlands is part of the tag, the name tag, that it gets informally referred to as that. And when someone's in a panic and calling 911, they call it the Woodlands. And specifically, uh, I think it would be interesting to go look at your website um, and the careers page on there. It says careers at the Woodlands. Uh, for, and it's part of the Cape Memory Care website. And, and it's that, as an example, that leads to my concern that it may be on an informal basis referred to as the Woodlands. And, and it, it might be helpful to bring that website up on the computer um, and project, project it. You want me to do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, Maureen said she might I, be able to do that. Anybody that wants to do it can is free to do it. But I, uh, just to add what Liza is saying, I also am concerned um, that you did not bring an example of what the logo may look like. The only thing that we have to go by is your web page. And currently, your web page is very much like the sign that's out at Scott Dyer Row right now. Bright red letters, Woodlands Assisted Living, smaller muted green letters, Cape Memory Care. And you're saying you're going to incorporate Woodlands Assisted Living as part of the sign. And I'm not comfortable right now. Is it going to look like the Scott Dyer sign road, where the Woodlands is up top, Cape Memory Care is down below, in keeping with the logo that you have on your web page? Because then I'm not comfortable saying that's the direction we should go. And I would point out, I, I understand the branding. And I looked at your Woodlands. You have Assisted Living in Hollowell. You have the uh, at Waterville and so on, but you also have your Hillside Terrace Senior Living. I take it it must not be a part of Woodlands because there's absolutely no mention of Woodlands when I go into the Hillside Terrace Senior Living webpage. Is there not a connection? Is, how come that one can be so different and but part of the family? The other, the other, the other facilities are all uh, part of the same corporate structure and Hillside is not part of that legal corporate structure, I guess, is the, is the answer. But yet, it's one of our, it's the only facility that's not part of the Woodlands, uh, you know, corporate group, I guess, is a way to put it. But yet, we want it to include them, you know, to show them that, you know, it's part of what we do. Um, I mean, just, look, just looking at that, I, I don't think that would, if, if that were the sign. Oh, no, that's not going to be, that won't be the sign. I, I understand that. <laughs> But, but rather than getting, my inclination is to ask you to come forward with something, show us a graphic of what it's going to look like. I mean, we can conditionally approve it, but, you know, hold back on the, the occupancy permit until we see the proposed signage. Sure. Because I, I don't, we're either going to have that issue now or we're going to have it at the time, or we're not. But I, I'd like to get it on the table and, and deal with it. Do you think it would be, well, you, you, you say you've got to run it by the fire chief. That's the big. Show me the graphic. Show me what it's going to look like out there. I will run it by the fire okay. safety. I mean, the public safety folks, the police, the fire, whoever, DPW, whoever else needs to know how to get there quickly and ask them whether they think it's confusing or not. They're the guys driving the trucks. I, I understand. I understand that. But, but seeing that, I'm not comfortable approving this and going home tonight. Personally, and I'm not trying to hold you up. I think what you're doing. No, no, I, 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 don't. I think what you're doing out there is a wonderful project. Yep. And from the beginning, I thought that. Yep. But this is this is a sticking point. I think uh, this this is going this is going okay. Uh, the, <laughs> We're waiting for you. <laughs> I'll come back. I'll come back with a you know a sign. It'll be similar to the village crossing sign with just our little thing across the bottom. And, if, and then if, you, if go, you go we to have the graphic, it gets approved that night. You know, when you go to pull the permit for it and the final occupancy permit, and as long as it looks like that, you're not going to have an issue. Okay. So, I mean, uh, do you want to, my thought would be to table this till next month's meeting and have you bring back a graphic. Yeah, that's. You're not that's, looking for an OP before. Yeah, we're not. We're not in a hurry. 
So what I would like to do is, I think you've got, does anyone else want to add to this discussion? No, I, I agree. I agree too, but, and I think the one thing to speed the process is get the graphic to Maureen, who will get it to the fire chief and the police chief long before the meeting, so we'll have their written approval. Or not. Or not. And work with Maureen on it too, because she's got a very good idea of what the police chief and the fire chief are looking for. Is that not, not correct? correct? And, and you'll make your way a lot simpler if you bring her, bring her a couple of graphics and let her, let the police chief and the fire chief look at them. And then by the time it gets to us, we have, it's like clockwork, it'll take three minutes. We're not trying to be sticky, but this no, could be I a problem. I don't, actually, I, this is going better than I anticipated that it would. I mean, it's... <laughs> We're not impossible. It's I'm just not some sure people think we're impossible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, so are you all set? I. You have a clear understanding of what you need to do. Do you have a clear understanding of what you need to do? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to entertain a motion. And to we're, we're gonna we're gonna change the we're gonna change the website too because I don't I don't like the looks of it. I'm not the one that did it, and uh, so. I think that would be a really good idea. So yeah. you're really focusing on the Cape Memory yeah. Care, which is a very nice title. And, and I will market. second what Peter said. I think it's a great project, and we're wishing you all the success good. in the world. Thank you. So uh, we want you to have it just right. We really do. Yeah, me too. <laughs> anyway, I, I, I guess I'll All right. I'd like to make a motion. Right be it ordered that based on the previously approved plans and materials, the request submitted and the facts presented, the request of Lon Walters to change the name of Evergreen, Evergreen Memory Care located at 126 Scott Dyer Road, be tabled until the next meeting of the planning board. Public. Do we need next public meeting of the planning board? Second. Uh, August 17th? No, I didn't have a date. Let me just double check that. Do we need a specific date? Yeah, 17th. August 17th. On August 17th. Okay. Motion having been made. Second. Seconded by Mr. Hubner. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion? All those opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Thank you. Thank you. Thank See you in August. Uh, next item on the agenda is the Shore Road Path Site Plan Resource Protection. I'd like to disclose that I've had fundraising conversations. It's oh, not, hold on. not a good yeah, time. Hold on. Okay. We'll get to that. Part of this is going to take a, a few seconds to get us uh, okay. connected. To the oh, program. and a conversation about the nature of this meeting, uh, it being an impartial hearing. And, so, and I don't think either of those would affect my impartiality. So could you say that again? I, I couldn't hear you. Oh. Uh, and so fundraising conversations and uh, conversations about the impartiality of this hearing, how we're judging the facts of the application against the ordinance itself. And I don't think either of those conversations would affect my impartiality. Anyone disagree with that? Want to discuss it? Hearing none. As soon as the applicant is ready. Just for the record. Uh, the applicant is the town of Cape Elizabeth requesting site plan review and a resource protection permit to construct the Shore Road Path, a two-mile long off-road path located on Shore Road from the old entrance to Fort Williams next to the pond to the town center under Section 19-9, Site Plan Public Hearing, and Section 19-8-3, Resource Protection Permit Public Hearing. Uh, well, we're getting the uh, computer connected and everything. Uh, thought we'd start and just kind of review uh, where we are in the process. Uh, the project was originally submitted to the planning board and discussed at the June 15th meeting. If you could introduce, uh, so tell us who you are and who you and you, who you're with and who you represent. That Paul Burbage with AMEC. I've got uh, Bet Betsy Melrose and John Mitchell from Mitchell Associates here. Apologize for diving. No in problem. Quickly. Um, had the original or initial public meeting on the 15th of June, and uh, there were several concerns raised during those discussions, and just wanted to, to hit on those real quick and identify what we've done to date and in our most recent submission to address those concerns. Um, one item that was in the minutes that I think was a, maybe a typo, uh, 
there was a point where we discussed what type of curbing would be used on the project. It was identified as vert six inch vertical curbing. It's actually going to be Cape Cod curbing, which has got a bevel as opposed to a vertical face. Still six inches in height, though. And that's bituminous, not granite. It's bituminous, not granite, correct. Okay. Um, there was a, uh, we discussed a uh, need for an easement agreement with the Barber family uh, related to re uh, relocating some of the path on their, on their property or outside the right of way. We had a meeting on June 7th with Kathy Barber and reviewed what was in the, the plan set that was submitted on uh, for the fifth, June 15th meeting. Uh, several changes were requested primarily to, to move the path more towards the right of way and, and to have it less on her property than it was shown at that point. Uh, in our new presentation, those adjustments have been made. Uh, Mrs. Barber agreed in, in principle to an easement agreement for grading onto their, onto their property as well as some storm drainage and maintenance required for those things. We have yet to formalize the agreement but are working towards that and uh, expect that to be a condition of approval tonight if it board so chooses. Um, one of the items that mentioned is the financial capacity. Um, just wanted to make clear to the board that we the town are not going to have the path constructed in a haphazard fashion. If at some point we reach a certain level of funding that allows for a large section to be constructed, we'll go out to bid. The applicant will have the right of refusal for all bids if things don't seem to financially work out. We certainly have no intent of leaving a project half constructed or in a haphazard fashion. Just wanted to reassure everyone of that fact. We will certainly come to revisit the board if, in fact, we, it needs to be constructed in a phased program and seek your approval for such, absolutely. Um, parking. Uh, we don't envision or have not proposed any additional new parking for this project. Uh, the intent is to use the existing parking here at Town Hall as well as that which is provided at uh, Fort Williams. Uh, no additional parking of any kind is planned. Um, and don't anticipate that any additional parking would be, would be necessary. In fact, I think the majority of the, the people that will be using the path are going to be those who live in the neighborhood close by, and based on that, that's, that's why we don't feel that there's a need for new proposed parking. Um, in terms of the stormwater, uh, we've provided several additional bits of information in the, our most recent submission. Uh, originally, we had intended to provide off-site stormwater treatment uh, in its entirety inside Fort Williams and after further discussions with Bob Malley and Public Works uh, thought it best to treat about 75% of the, the square footage that's required by DEP at the high school and uh, that water would discharge to the Spurwink Marsh which is a, a higher, more, more important or highly sensitive or more sensitive wetland area so we think you're going to get the, the best bang for your buck there However, we're going to still need to treat uh, about 6,000 square feet uh, at the entrance to Fort Williams, which we're going to capture runoff from Shore Road. And uh, in both areas, that will be treated in a Filtera type system, which basically treats the first inch of uh, runoff in a, in a rain event. Um, other questions and concerns that have been raised was uh, erosion and erosion and sedimentation control. Uh, this latest set of plans or submissions uh, shows placement of check dam, silt fence, uh, those types of things. Uh, while they might not encompass everything that will be required as part of the project, um, we have included some additional no notation in the, in the plan set to, to hopefully capture up and uh, address those concerns that the board may have. Uh, next item is a third party review. Uh, Oak Engineers was retained. Stephen Bradstreet has conducted his review. With, in fact, I believe the board is in receipt of a letter from uh, Oak Engineers, and we'll talk specifically to those items in just a moment that he, that Stephen raised. Um, the one other uh, meeting we've had uh, Monday this week was with uh, Jim McDonough uh, regarding his letter. I believe that was sent uh, earlier in the month. And uh, several things transpired at the meeting, and I think Maureen has got some uh, conditions that would be incorporated in anything at, at the table of the meeting in terms of conditions of approval. Uh, primarily, 
between Pond Cove and uh, Mr. McDonough's driveway, uh, he had requested that we relocate the path, pushing it more towards the inland side of the right-of-way uh, and to preserve the, the, uh, the plantings along the edge of the pavement, uh, one for screening for his, for his interest, and uh, he was amenable to provide a grading easement and maintenance agreement uh, to facilitate that, uh, that particular change. Uh, we, we talked about several other, other items, particularly uh, putting in a F-type or a catch basin on the north side of his, uh, or the south side of his driveway, and instead of uh, reducing the amount of water that is currently running down his driveway, and discharge that uh, on the uh, north side of his driveway. Uh, other than that, those are the, primarily the, the concerns that were raised by the board in the meeting minutes from the 15th. Um, we tried to address those in our latest submission. In terms of Oak Engineers, specific uh, uh, issues or concerns raised. Uh, item two in uh, this list related to the calculations for the uh, stormwater treatment system provided at uh, the high school as well as uh, the interest of Fort Williams. He requested that the design calculations be provided for review. And they haven't at this point, but they certainly will be. Uh, details for the two Filtera systems, the curbing and catch basin, those additional details will be enlarged on the plans and provided as requested. Uh, we, item four discussed the construction grading easement for the Barber property. We've discussed that and intend to, to get that submitted to the board at, at our earliest convenience. Um, Place a, number five was place a note on the uh, plan set to indicate that the latest version of the best man management practices will be adhered to. The note has so been uh, addressed. At this point, and in uh, item six, the designer will make sure that no area of the sidewalk will channelize flows on the sidewalk. Uh, we believe we've addressed those issues and we'll review them once again, but if we've, anything else is identified, we certainly it is our intent to, to, to meet that request. Uh, utility pole guy wires, uh, there are probably a half dozen uh, guy poles that need to be relocated and we will certainly double check and confirm that uh, the guy wires do not interfere with the clearance required for snow removal equipment or pedestrian use. Um, Proposed guardrail design uh, should be evaluated to determine if the current roadside safety design standard, standards uh, have been met or is acceptable to the town. Uh, we have made, uh, or will be making some phone calls to MDOT to review that. One of Mr. McDonough's requests was that uh, a section of the wood guardrail uh, on the south side of his home be a removable section so that he can have access to that side of his property, which he can't reasonably get to from his driveway. And that's, that is also one of the elements that we'll need to discuss with MDOT and, and Public Works. Um, wherever possible, the design shall avoid having storm water along the edge, storm water flow along the edge of the pavement. We've addressed that, uh, uh, as we believe, to the, to the extent practical, um, given the fact that uh, there isn't a contiguous storm drain system that runs the length of Shore Road that has certainly uh, had its challenges associated with it. But to the degree that we can meet that requirement or that request, I think we've, we've diligently done so. Uh, if somebody has a specific issue, we certainly are happy uh, to discuss those. Um, and lastly, uh, all mailbox relocations should be approved uh, by the Postal Service. Uh, we actually met with the Postal Service on May 25th and uh, discussed mailbox relocation, received, received uh, direction from them as to what they thought was appropriate, and uh, we would certainly be happy to issue a set of plans to them for their, their review and or comment and provide that information to the board, whether if anything's received. Um, other than that, uh, I think we're going to jump right in and go over the, the presentation. John Mitchell. Yep. Thanks, Paul. Um, I, guess, I guess that's the first question um, is, does the board wish to have another PowerPoint presentation? <laughs> <laughs> it's up to you. Since, since I've seen, seen it, seen it four times, uh, personally, no. But 
my thought would be, are there any, any particular things that you want to highlight in terms of the changes? Well, and maybe that yeah, Paul, Paul just reviewed. Sorry. Basically, there have been two changes um, to, the, to the actual pathway alignment and we've incorporated them into the PowerPoint presentation. If the board wishes to just focus on those two revisions, we can do that, or we can go through the full. Now, my inclination would be just sort of click through until you hit each one and then let the board know. If, does anyone feel differently? I'm not inclined to have the whole thing presented again. I'm particularly concerned with any revisions that move the path closer to the traffic lanes, and I gather that one, if not both, of the two properties you've discussed would be moving the pedestrian traffic closer to the automobile traffic. So I would certainly like to see those slides right. because that was a big issue when we walked the area. One, one change move, moved it further away from Shore Road. The other change moved it a little bit closer to Shore Road, but still maintaining the five-foot wide buffer. Okay. But I'll, I'll so point those out. Right. So flip through. Yeah, I'm, I'm waiting for the whole board to come up with that consensus, Myra. No, that's fine with me, but I, would you please, when you get to um, Mr. McDonough's property, yeah. go through those, all those points on it, because he had a lot of questions, and I know you met with him. But Barbara, have you seen, you, you've seen this right there. Mark. I have, but I would like to see it visually, because it's really hard to, I'm not even quite sure where he is on the, well, I did, I did find the location, but I would just like a brief explanation okay. of how they're going to be accomplished because I thought he had some points that were very valid. Okay, before I turn it over to John, any of the board members have any of the questions, comments, thoughts, or suggestions? Okay, go ahead, John. Okay, thank you. Uh, once again, the, the uh, presentation consists of 20 slides uh, extending from Fort Williams to the town center, uh, a length of approximately 11,000 square feet, uh, 11,000 linear feet, um, or a little over two miles. Uh, included in the slides is a uh, plan view of the pathway, uh, photos of existing conditions, and there are a series of seven photo simulations that we've prepared to show you, to illustrate what the path uh, may look like in those various locations. Um, the resulting design is a five foot wide bituminous pathway which provides lower maintenance costs and is a stable surface for accessibility. The pathway location has been determined uh, with sensitivity to the natural and built field features and with placing a high priority on pedestrian safety. And finally, the design of the Shore Road path has been a balance of providing safety needs of the pedestrians and the preservation of the natural and physical features of Shore Road. Beginning at the former entrance to uh, Fort Williams, uh, this is the former entrance here. The path begins and meanders up through the existing uh, tree canopy uh, to this location, which is another former entrance to the to the park. Um, at this location and uh, we have proposed to relocate the chain link fence or, or we're going to provide a new chain link fence but it's going to be set back approximately 15 feet into the park and the purpose of this is to allow the pedestrian to use the pathway uh, during closing hours of the park uh, so the relocation of the fence extends to this point which is roughly the high point of Shore Road in this location. It's the crest of the hill. And it's at this location where we're proposing to have the first of two crosswalks. <coughs> um, there's uh, sufficient uh, sight distance in, in either direction, both to the north and to the south. Uh, we have shown a short section of uh, pathway that connects, that will connect to the existing Green Bay Greenbelt path here. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm supposed to flip through these. Uh, <laughs> it's just like a machine, John. Uh, okay, so the path continues down Shore Road. Um, and this location, this is uh, adjacent to Diapon Road. Uh, we're proposing 
a, uh, to install a new guardrail, a timber guardrail, uh, to replace the old metal guardrail. Um, in this location is one of the seven photo simulations. This is what it looks like today, and this is what it will look like with the new timber guardrail in the pathway on the other side of the, uh, the guardrail. Uh, it continues down. In this location here, we're proposing to uh, the, the right-of-way line becomes uh, very narrow in this location, uh, as well as we have some topographical issues that we have to deal with. So we're proposing to place the pathway adjacent to Shore Road, but have it raised six inches with a curve. This is not a change. This was on our previous presentation. Um, in this location is the beginning of the raised boardwalk, and it continues to this location. This is the property, the MC Associates property that the board reviewed uh, last month, and this is the uh, roughly the location of the private access way that will access that property. Uh, this line right here represents the beginning of the Robinson Woods property. Uh, so the pathway will continue uh, within the right-of-way. Uh, this is a small wetland area here. We're going to sort of swing the pathway around the wetland. Uh, this is the beginning of the large ledge outcrop uh, as shown on these two slides. And we're going to traverse the uh, the ledge and, and run the path along the top of the ledge and then traverse back down uh, in this location. Uh, the pathway runs along Robinson Woods with um, you know relatively good separation between the path and, um, and the edge of pavement. Uh, it will come down, and this location is the beginning of the gravel parking area for, for Robinson Woods. So it will end here, or the, the paved section will end there. The pedestrian will cross the gravel surface and then, be, and then picked up again at this location here. Um, this is the bridge to uh, Pond Cove. Uh, we're spanning approximately 30 feet over the, uh, the waterway, which outlets into Pond Cove. Um, we've done a photo simulation of that bridge in this location here. So this is what it looks like now, and uh, that's an illustration of uh, the footbridge in the pathway. So this is the beginning of the uh, McDonough property, roughly, in this location here. Um, what we have done is to relocate the pathway. Uh, previously, it was it was relatively close to Shore Road, and in meeting with uh, Mr. McDonough, uh, he wanted to see if we could preserve a uh, a row of existing Rosa Ragosa that's out there now that, according to Jim, uh, helps to uh, prevent erosion, siltation during heavy storms, uh, particularly when Pond Cove floods. So we have done that. Uh, we've shown the relocation of the pathway closer to the right-of-way line. So the Rose, Rosa Ragosa is between the pathway and the traffic lane? Correct. Okay. Yeah. This is the spot. Okay. So we, we have done that. Uh, so you can see that uh, uh, the pathway runs right along the edge of the right-of-way. Uh, Mr. McDonough's driveway is located here. Uh, the catch basin that Paul was referring to will be placed right there. Sorry for the shaky hand. Uh, and then the pipe will outlet into this area here. See, I think his property line is right there. Right there. Okay. So yeah. that's part of your property where you have the access issue. 
where we want. No. Oh, left, left, more, left, more, John. more. right there. Is that the property line? That's the property. Okay. The question is about the removable guardrail section. Yeah, I'll, I'll get to that, Eliza. It's on the next slide. Okay, so that is the property line right there. Uh, so the pathway runs along here. Now this this section, as you know, uh, consists of individual bollards that Mr. McDonough placed to help discourage or, or prevent traffic from parking there. And what we're proposing to do is to uh, replace the bollards with a timber guardrail that will run along the edge of the road and, and once again place the pathway on the other side. And we're going to preserve all of the landscaping and the ledge outcrop that runs along his frontage. Um, this is the area right here where Mr. McDonough was uh, concerned about having access for delivery vehicles, oil, um, and so forth. So we are going to look at uh, putting a, a We've got to explore exactly what would be acceptable there. To, to public works and uh, MDOT as far as having a, um, a guardrail with a removable um, section in it. Can I ask you, is the, the thought that actually a truck would back across the, road, the, the lawn at that point? I'm kind of confused about that. Could, according to uh, Mr. McDonough, uh, the oil delivery trucks currently drive up to, onto his property to get out of the roadway to deliver oil, which is on this side of his home. Do we know anything about the sight distances and things for trucks pulling in and out of Shore Road that way? I mean, in a sense, it seems almost like a second driveway, if, that's, if we're opening it up for that purpose. We haven't measured the site distance. I can tell you from just memory that the site distance is is pretty good in that location. It's a straightaway in both directions. And is um, the proposal that the private landowner would then have the right to remove the public safety railing in connection with private deliveries? And if so, is that done anywhere else in town? I'm not sure that he would. I, I, I mean, the, I think this whole issue is going to require a written agreement. It, it's going to require a written easement agreement, which town attorney and, and you know, both sides will certainly review and critique and resolve. And, uh, but it will be a formal easement agreement, just for part of an easement agreement. You can let, me put these quest let me put my questions in context. We, we had received a proposed, a potential set of additional conditions of approval, which would have had us mandating a removable guardrail. And it seemed to me that we, my question is, are we yet at that spot? Because there seem to be a number of safety issues involved in that. And this seemed probably a, um, a premature mandatory condition on our part. It needs to be explored with MDOT Public Works. We just met with Mr. McDonough on Monday this week and things have not progressed that far down the road. Okay. What we're hoping and trying to accomplish is there are a number of easement issues that we need to obtain and if there's a legal instrument to indicate how that should function or be operated, that would be, at least in my humble opinion, a, a reasonable place to insert that, that kind of language. But there is also access to that property off of the side road right there. It's a corner property, am I right? No. No, it is no, not it's a corner property. Yeah. Okay, I was thinking it was on the corner. You, you may be thinking about his driveway. But I think the issue is he can't get to the far side of his home or the north side of his home from, from the, the driveway reasonably. Right now he uses... 
No, no, I, I he just said it. I mean, I'm, I'm wondering why we can't use the existing driveway, but, or how it, how it might be done differently not to have this kind of a situation, which could be very tricky. Hold, hold on just a second, Marie. I, I, I was with the applicant and met with Mr. McDonough. Um, I'm representing the planning board. And even if the, the problem with the property is that on the side where his driveway is right now, there's a dramatic slope. So on the side where the driveway is, his house is actually four stories high. And even in the last storm we had in February, he had several trees come down and they accessed his property from the southern side and they drove right up onto it because it's all ledge. And so even if he gets oil deliveries off of his driveway, the, the expectation is that occasionally he's going to want to have access from that other side. He said he'd, he's driven up there to move furniture in and out. And um, the town has accommodated a property owner in a similar instance before. Uh, the Winnick Woods property, which is on Sawyer Road, uh, there is an abutter immediately adjacent to that. There was an existing farm road that the town does not use for access to the property. We built a new access point, new, new parking lot, but we did preserve Mr. Chapman and Mrs. Moore's access to their property off of that farm road because they sometimes use it to get to their backyard. So there is the occasional opportunity to get to the other side of the property. We have done this at least once before. With a removable guardrail? In that case, there's no guardrail yeah. at all. It's just a, it's an existing driveway. But, you know, it's, it's acknowledging that, you know, people's properties have unique situations and on rare occasions they need accommodation. I, cer I certainly agree that Mr. McDonough's intent is not to have another driveway or another curb cut situation, mm. as, just as Maureen indicated. I think it's more on that rare occasion when something significant happens, i.e. you've got storm damage or you need to make some substantial repair to your house or something of that sort. It's not something that would be intended for use every day for the purposes of coming and going from the property. And, and but, for, but for oil deliveries regularly, I mean, two or three times a year, somebody's going to be picking this thing up. And Not more than that. Or whatever. Right. Ten times a year. <laughs> I guess the point is, it's, it, it, I'm just trying to understand the dimensions of it. I mean, sure. I, I have no experience, but has MDOT ever done something like this before? I mean, uh, Not that I'm personally aware of. It doesn't mean that they haven't been asked the question or it hasn't come up previously, but uh, it's one of those things you've you, you got to ask the question. And let's assume some public, you know, MDOT or whatever that says no. It's just we can't do this because it's just not safe enough. There's no such thing, whatever. We'll have to uh, redress that with, with Mr. McDonough, obviously, and, okay. and come to some other resolution to the issue. I'm a little Liza? confused because it seems, from my copy of the plans, the existing bollards run the length of the, his property between his driveway and the property to the right. Right. How does so he get up it there? appears that right now access is limited because of those bollards. Yeah, but they, they can drive, you can drive between, between them. them. Yeah. There's probably 10, I haven't measured it, but there's likely 10, 10 or so feet between them at a minimum. And you can fit a vehicle between them. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's... I mean, that's one of the reasons, that's the reason why we're trying to accommodate Mr. McDonough in this situation is where we're taking these bollards that they can drive a vehicle through and replacing it with a, you know, a barrier, basically. So, you know, he, he voiced the uh, concern and um, this is the solution that we came up with, trying to accommodate his needs. And the guardrail is there because at that point we have less than a five foot buffer between them, right? That's the correct. Right, right. Correct, as, as well as Mr. McDonough's intent not to have people park on his pro or in the right of way for purposes of walking across the road and viewing the, the, the water, which is a lovely sight across the road from him. That's originally why he installed those bollards, was to not have that, that situation transpire. So we, we're trying to do a multitude of things with the guardrail, one of which is to provide separation for pedestrians as well as encourage folks not to park in, in that particular area. Can you point out where the additional ground cover planting is Yeah, I was just going to do that. Okay. Yeah. So um, by placing the, uh, the pathway right along the edge of the 
ledge, we end up with, there are two or three pockets of grass that will be left as the, as the ledge undulates back and forth. Uh, we're left with two or three pockets of grass, which he asked us, could we, could we do something with those spaces? They're very small. And our recommendation was to replace the grass with low ground cover plantings. With what? So I'm sorry, I didn't hear. With to replace the grass, the turf area with that requires mowing with um, low ground cover plantings. Thank you. Is that in the public right of way or on his private? It's on the public right of way. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see, um, quickly, th this section of the pathway is adjacent to a wetland um, and we're proposing to place a small uh, retaining wall in this section to minimize the impacts on the wetland. So the pathway runs up. This is. Uh, this is the Robinson property. There's a 24-inch culvert that crosses at this location. Uh, as you can see, we're proposing to swing the pathway a little closer to Shore Road, but provide some separation. And we're going to put in a, um, a head wall uh, in this location to protect the end of the culvert. And then the pathway runs up um, along the Robinson property. This is the barn for the Robinson property, um, runs up, this is Smuggler's Cove Road. Uh, in this location, um, if you remember, we, we are proposing to swing the path uh, towards the right-of-way line a bit in order to preserve some nice uh, oak trees that are very close to the edge of the road. So there is an opportunity to do this. It's a little little clearing in the middle of the vegetation that will allow us to do that. Uh, and then it comes back out again. And uh, this is a photo simulation, which is difficult to see, but the path is inside the middle of the, the vegetation. Um, OK, so the, the pathway runs up. This is Beach Bluff Road, which is located here runs along. Uh, this is Hillcrest. Uh, another photo simulation. This is what it looks like today. And this is what it would look like with a path preserving the stone wall and giving a, a nice five foot wide or greater buffer in this area. Uh, this is the Barber property. This is the driveway entrance to the Barber property um, in the inch a lot of the shrubbery that is right at the entrance is very close to the roadway and it will require some removal of the shrubbery uh, which we plan on uh, replacing. It's in this area here. And if you look on the planting plan, you'll see um, proposed plantings to replace the existing junipers and mews. What has changed on the Barber property? Right here. Just the shrubbery? No, I'm, I'm going to show it to you. Um, in this location, uh, previously we uh, had the pathway run right over the right-of-way. It was part on her property and partly on, within the right-of-way. And after meeting with them and having a site visit, and the reason we did this was to preserve a, a, is a clump of maple right here. Um, but after meeting with her and doing a site visit and a site walk, um, she asked if we could move it a little closer to Shore Road um, to bring it up the slope and run it along this area here, which will require the removal of that clump of maple. Uh, but we agreed to do that. So that is the second uh, change of the relocation of the pathway. Uh, this area where the ledge outcrop is very close to the edge of the road, um, on the plan view we're proposing to uh, place the pathway right along the edge of the pathway. 
uh, with a curved section. So this path will be more like a sidewalk with a six inch curb uh, placed along the frontage. And a photo simulation of that area, this is what it looks like today, and this is what it will look like. So the pathway runs with a curb right along the edge and then it swings back. Um, this area, the pathway is pretty, pretty consistent um, running along. Okay, um, this area is the second of the two crossings. Uh, and this is very close to Julianne Lane. You, we cross Julianne Lane, uh, go a few feet up, and then cross at this point. There's excellent sight distance in either direction. And then we're running up along the, uh, oh, this is a photo simulation uh, at Julianne Lane. Uh, going underneath the, uh, the, the pine tree. It's located at the corner. Um, and then it runs up in this section right here from this point to this point is a curved section. Again, a six inch curve. The, the pathway will be raised. Uh, this is in front of the, uh, this is in front of the Rand property and we're proposing to relocate a row of lilacs that are currently on within the right-of-way. And I've, I've uh, talked with Alice Rand about this, and uh, although she doesn't like it, she uh, has agreed to allow us to do that. And then the connection to the existing walkway in front of the doctor's office happens at that point. All set? All set. Thank you. So the applicant has done his presentation, its presentation? Yes. Uh, before we open up the public hearing, you need a break? Okay. Um, I'd like to know, any, anybody from the board have any questions of the applicant before I open it up to public comments? Hearing none, I'd like to open the public hearing and invite anyone up to the podium to make their comments concerning the application. If you could state your My name is Bill Downs. I live at 15 Old Colony Link. <clears throat> I just have a few general comments. In the uh, memorandum requesting the start review on page 3, section K, I believe that that is the Shore Road Path project has been approved by the Town Council. That is technically inaccurate. The council approved steps in the process to do the project, but not the whole project itself. It's just a clarification for my purposes, if you will. But, but the, the, the council has not approved the project. They've just steps along the way. Okay. Um, the second comment I have is on page four, dealing with the uh, permit standards, and it rolls over onto page five. <clears throat> uh, it mentions that in that second paragraph there where it begins, there's a moderate, moderate high value wildlife habitat. Um, where, where are you, which number are you reading? Okay, this is number four, which rolls over onto page five. Number four. Page four. It rolls onto page five. It begins, the first uh, sentence there is the path is proposed adjacent to Shore Road. There's no wildlife habitat within the right-of-way of Shore Road. I'm sorry, I'm still not seeing Okay, it. in the memorandum, page five. Page four. Okay. Okay. It starts, it all deals with the permit on siting and dealing with waters, the environmental standards. I think waters. your pagination is different than ours. Is yeah. I took it right off the website, so. It's just probably didn't print it's the way the printer it's breaks. Section, begins a section on resource protection permit standards, section 1983. Right, I can find it. Okay. Are you following me now? I found four, yes. Okay. Um, there says there is moderate to high value of wildlife habitat upland of Pine Cove. Okay. So there is a presumption that there is no um, essential wildlife habitat within Pine Cove, or for that matter, any of the other wetlands. Is there any basis for that statement, so the statements there too? 
When was the last time uh, a study or survey was done and eight counts were done in any of the wetlands? Okay, that, that was the next one. Okay, beavers. I think Mr. Mitchell was going to address it and probably just forgot about it. As it stands now, you know, there's a large population of beavers in Pond Cove. They've been there six or seven years. We've tried trapping, couldn't get rid of them. And when they build up dams in front of the uh, culvert, the water table rises. That poses a problem for all of us on Old Colony Lane because our basements get flooded. So it's essential that the DPW, who's done a great job so far, of being able to get down there with the backhoe and pull out all the debris, including inside the culvert pipes. If you're going to put a bridge over the top of the culvert, how does the backhoe get inside the, the culvert pipes? Uh, next point is maintenance. I've been told that this is going to be a year round and that the issue that everybody's addressed is strictly the snow pond. What comes to mind is in a lot of places, a right away has been consumed, put in the buffer and the sidewalk. Does the town need permission to be able to push the snow onto people's private property? Because I know several people who don't want to see that. In the summertime, you're going to have a couple areas, two in particular. One is the high ground alongside or adjacent to the land trust property. And the second part is the drop off on the Robinson Field property. Right now you have mowers that can go up and down the road and they can drop a blade which can cut five or six feet along the edge of the road. Well, you have a lot of natural vegetation in those two locations. In the summertime, it's going to fill in because in the case of the Robinson Field, you've got wild bamboo, which will just take over. Who's going to take care of that or have you considered what the cost is going to be? I mean, everything is focused to date from all the hearings I've been is on a snow plow. But you've got the summer issue also. And it won't take long, especially with the bamboo, to just completely overtake the sidewalk. So where are people going to go? Okay. Last one is the parking at Belfield Road, where the pillars are main entrance to land trust property. In the summertime, it gets very busy there. You get people going into the land trust, you get people going down to the beach. Originally, when this pathway was conceived and going through the planning process, this was going to bring people from all over the place, all over town, would drive to come use this sidewalk, this pathway. Now we're hearing, well, it's only going to be mostly the local people that use it. I, I, know, I don't know which one it's going to be, but that little parking area gets extremely hazardous when you get more than 10 or 12 cars down there. So it's going to become a problem, and it's something that somebody should address before you put in the sidewalk, because it's going to become, people park now even with the no parking signs, but it's going to become a problem. That's all I have. Thank you for your comments. Anyone else wishing to speak concerning the application? <coughs> uh, Nelson Silva, 11 Old Colony Lane. And I had two concerns. One was drainage and one was safety. Bill's touched on the drainage part. Uh, but I recall when we first started down the road for this pathway, the main concern was pedestrian and cycle safety. With the road being a rural road, and it's a very narrow road, and I travel it every day. Uh, right now, you have, with the right-of-way on both sides of the road, it, it affords cars to be able to pull over when emergency vehicles are coming down the road and you have traffic coming both ways. Uh, and I've been on the road where I've had to pull into Robinson's uh, driveway by the barn in order for a fire truck to get by because there's another car on the other side of the road. Okay. Now you're going to build a pathway, which does away with the right-of-way shoulder that goes from uh, Fort Williams to town center. Uh, so now you have, now the question is, are bicycles, are cyclists still going to be allowed on this road, or is everybody going to be on the pathway? Uh, my understanding was it was supposed to be uh, a pathway for everyone, two ways. ADA approved, which means also motorized wheelchairs. I have a hard time conceiving how this can all happen on a five foot wide path. I've done a little bit of research and what I find where there are paths that are being utilized by pedestrians as well as runners and cyclists, minimum is 12 foot width. Brunswick has a 14 foot wide path to accommodate two-way traffic with fencing 
to separate it from the roadway. So my concern is, if cyclists are not going to be removed from the roadway, uh, and we've done away with the, the shoulder on the one side of the roadway, uh, now you're going to have cars having more, and cyclists having more of a problem with the roadway than you had before. So I don't see you know, where this is going to improve safety. Uh, the other question I have with the ADA is what is the maximum grade on the pathway? Because I know you, there's a part of the pathway that's going to go over the ledge. Is that a greater than a 2% grade or not? I don't know. Because ADA requires a, a grade no, no greater than 2% because motor, motorized wheelchairs cannot accommodate a higher grade. So I don't know what the answer to that one is. And, uh, and with Robinson's Woods parking lot, uh, well, I, I sent an email, I hope the board got it, with 20 slides. There was one there showing where a tree got hit by a car this la last year that traversed the road and went into the tree, which is right at the south end of the parking lot, which is basically where the pathway would be. So uh, there is a lot of traffic, like, like Bill said before, and uh, park cars pulling in and pulling out, people walking. Uh, you know, you just, it's creating, I don't see it, how that's improving safety uh, on IOTA. And as far as the, the culvert at Pond Cove, um, you have pictures of that. I, I won't go into all that, but that is a big concern. We've lost a lot of trees in the wetland, not because of the beavers. I mean, they've done a great damage, but because of the high water table, the trees have been suffocated, because their roots have been underwater for more than four or five years. In fact, I've had a you know, visitor just visiting with us, and they looked out the back, and they said, gee, it looks like a tornado went through here. So yeah, it's all the trees. Every time we have a windstorm, major trees keep going down, because they're just dying. So uh, those are my concerns, and I hope that they can be addressed. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak concerning the application? Hi, I'm Dan Friedman from Chiton Road. I just have a quick question. If, if um, could you I, speak up a little? Sure. Please. Will we be given a detailed construction plan that'll show the hours if this does go forward? That will show the hours of work, where storage materials are going to be, where I guess equipment might be. Because I can imagine in a multi-month project, this could be quite. Um, quite an intrusive process for those people that abut the road. And I think if this does go forward, I think it'd be important for us to actually be able to see an actual construction plan to see, you know, where materials are going to be stored, where cars are going to be parked, where equipment's going to be, and what are the areas of, um, of action. Thank you. 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 Anyone else wishing to speak concerning the project? Hi, my name is Jim Cassie. I live at 35th Avenue in Cape Elizabeth. And I just want to address a couple of the uh, concerns that were raised here, um, especially with regard to safety. Um, it should be understood that the shore road pathway is not intended for use by cyclists. Certainly, most cyclists who use shore road currently are going to continue to use the, uh, the traveled roadway. And by main state law, they have every right to do so. Um, the path is not a multi-use path it is more of a sidewalk and it should be understood as such. Um, the bigger concern safety wise is really the um, you know dozens of pedestrians that use that road on a daily basis. Um, uh, AASHTO, the uh, American Association of Highway and Traffic Officials, um, have documented that um, roadways that do not have sidewalks on them put pedestrians at double the risk of getting hit by cars. So there's no question that the, uh, the pathway will materially improve the safety of pedestrians using that road. And, and certainly as we come up to the uh, Beach to Beacon uh, event, you can see that a lot of people are running on that road. The, uh, the path will, I think, materially uh, improve safety. With regard to the, um, the culvert issues and some of the other issues that have come up, I mean, I think that these are, are good things to bring up now to think about. But I think that these are all issues that can be managed, um, and I'm sure that we will find a way to do so. I mean, there are many examples of pathways like this around the state, and indeed around the country, and uh, 
in the interest of creating a more walkable and pedestrian friendly Cape Elizabeth um, that's uh, providing safety to all its residents, I strongly urge you to um, move forward with the path. Anyone else wishing to speak concerning the uh, application? Hello, I'm Katie Valancourt, live at 55 Stony Brook Road, and I just wanted to admit my approval or my um, support of the project. As both a motorist and a runner here in this community, I am concerned for the safety um, of not only myself, <laughs> but those who might be on the road when I am a driver. And I only see this pathway uh, improving the aesthetics and the character of this town, which I'm very excited that the committee's even um, exploring something like this. But I know when I, as a driver, drive along Shore Road, I have to drive very defensively. And as you approach or go up a hill, I don't dare pass a single person. Um, I will wait for that runner because there could be somebody coming up over that hill and people do drive way too fast. And that's just, that's just the way it is. We can't change that. But um, I am very in, I'm very in favor of some sort of buffer and some sort of uh, path for myself as a runner or anybody who's on a bike. Um, I think it will really help connect the town to the fort and to the other part of uh, South Portland. So please note my support. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak to turn the application? Anyone else wishing to speak concerning the application? Going once, going twice, I'd like to close the public hearing. Thank you very much for your input and open up the floor to questions, comments, thoughts, and suggestions from the board, town planner. I don't know if the applicant wanted to address any of the issues uh, that the uh, public has raised. We certainly can address uh, some, of the, some of the comments just made by the public. Um, in terms of the maintenance of Pond Cove, I just want to be clear that based on our discussions with Mr. McDonough uh, on Monday, that he is going to provide a, a permanent maintenance easement or access to clean or keep the, the beaver cuttings out, you know, to clear out the debris as necessary to maintain the functionality of the uh, three culverts at Pond Cove. So it's, that is going to be uh, addressed. Meaning to get onto his property. To Correct. Do, which clearly would help him. Certainly, and, and thus is why he's, he supports this as well as a number of other uh, another individuals. Uh, in terms of the ADA compliance, um, we have spoken, we, we basically looked at two different standards, and uh, one of them is the ADA act, act itself, and there is a draft document, and I can't remember the date of it, but it's, is it 1993, Maureen? 97, 93, somewhere in that, in that range of things. It's never been finalized. And there is nothing specific to this project that requires strict adherence to either one of those standards. We did look at both of the standards and their implications. Um, what we have done to provide access to this is that in terms of uh, approaches to bridges or uh, the boardwalk, those kinds of things, they're all at grade. There aren't any steps involved. There are uh, certainly some slopes that are steeper than 6.5%. Um, but in trying to keep with the topography that exists and not being too disruptive in the design of the path, uh, to the degree that we can, we've, we've tried to, to meet the spirit of you know, access for those that uh, would be in wheelchairs or, or have some other type of uh, physical limitation that would make it difficult to use the path. So to the, to the extent practical, we've tried to address those. Um, we can certainly formalize a letter to express the research that we've done and, and document that and, and submit that uh, to the board to, to put in the record. Um, in terms of the maintenance, uh, the snow removal obviously is, is during the winter months, the, the, the primary concern, but uh, just like anything else, 
the town of public works and Bob feel free to, to pipe up if I, if I misspeak. Uh, there are going to be some maintenance issues and they'll have to be addressed annually like they are in other parts of town for public facilities. Um, we haven't necessarily sat down and had a, a conversation regarding the, the exact cost of those things, but uh, I do believe the Public Works Department understands the implications of, of what maintenance is going to be required. And uh, if there's any information the Public Works needs from us, we're more than happy to sit down and meet and discuss and formulate whatever might be helpful to them in est estimating that effort okay. in terms of uh, in, ter in terms of lay down areas, that's something that uh, should probably discuss with you, Bob, and others, just to to make sure that uh, we've we've picked some good locations. I mean, one of the things that comes to mind is, is Skip Murray's facility right here at, at, in the back 40 there. Um, but they, I don't think we're planning to stage materials, you know, have stockpile materials on the edge of the road or those kinds of things. It's it's. It's really not going to work well with, with what's there in the limited space in the road. Uh, there may be some private property owners that we may approach and see if there is some, some location that we may be able to use a few spots along the way, but that would generally how we would approach this over the, uh, you know, prior to the construction of the project. And then try to identify those in the uh, construction documents themselves, which in order to get the permits necessary to start construction, that would be uh, addressed at that point. I'm assuming too, like now, uh, any kind of construction schedule, road closings would be on the website and learning people. Certainly, certainly. There's a there's a there's a process to to go with a, a public works project of this type, and uh, all of that information I think would be made available to the public and everyone else to to review prior to the actual start of construction. Thank you. You're welcome. Before you sit down, may I ask you a question? Certainly. Um, can you respond to the concern about cars? moving to the side to get access to emergency vehicles and how that might be affected by the pathway in places where it comes quite close to the road? Uh, I can't speak specifically for all drivers, but uh, in, in, as far as I'm concerned, personally and professionally, uh, the, the demand is really to get out of the way in a safe and expedient manner. And I would not suggest that you run over the guardrail or any of those kinds of things, but we all have to agree to be reasonable in, in how we address those things. Have, has some of the, the road shoulder been narrowed in effect by having some guardrail installed and boardwalks and those kinds of things? I would say yes, they have been effective. Um, do I think they're unreasonably effective? Uh, in my opinion, they, they have not been. However, you know, if you need to get out of the way of the emergency equipment, you need to do so at the earliest possible point that, that makes good reasonable sense to do so. Uh, if there's a specific issue that the, the fire chief or public safety has in, in terms of those issues, uh, we'd be happy to sit with them and discuss those in particular. But uh, in, in terms of the, the number of square foot over the two mile length of the path, we're looking at uh, well, less than 500 feet worth of guardrail, or call it a thousand feet for argument's sake. That's, that's only 10% of the length and it's not necessarily concentrated in any one area. So if you're, if you're looking at it over you know, every 500 feet, can you reasonably find some place to pull over or make way? And I believe that's that's the case. Um, there was one comment from the gentleman about there's that one culvert and there's a bridge over it now. Will that reduce access for backhoe getting down in there to, to, to clear that out? If, I, I believe, I just want to confirm we're talking about at Pond Cove for that particular, yeah. yes. Okay. They'll it, it, still be able to get in there? I think they were talking about an easement with Mr. McDonough. Okay. I'm Correct. Sure. For, for that purpose, to right. allow a, a backhoe to get there, yes. Okay. Right. The, the only other question I have is this removable guardrail <laughs> issue, <laughs> because I, I don't know how to incorporate that into whatever proposed anything we have. Um, um, the suggestion I, or if I may, I would make. I'm, I'm open to ideas. Uh, and I, suggestion I, want to hash it out I would make is that the applicant will explore uh, options to provide that access that would be acceptable to Public Works as well as MDOT um, and would be formalized in an easement agreement. If, if that can't be reasonably provided, we will need to revisit with Mr. McDonough and 
try to find some other means to uh, to address to address that issue. But as it was discussed, the, the topography from his driveway does not allow a wheeled vehicle to easily access the rear and north side of his home, and that's that's really what we're trying to provide. Well, I have a couple of questions. I do have concern about bicycles. Um, you're going to have a three-year-old on that path, and the bicycle's going to come roaring through, and I know there are going to be bicycles on it. Bicycles go through Robinson Woods, which is a lot rougher, and one knocked me down about four or five years ago. Um, didn't mean to, and he was very apologetic, but if I had been a child, I could have been hurt. And it's not about me, it's about safety. I really am concerned. Are there going to be any signs up that deter bicycles from going on that path? I mean, you're going to get some bicycles on there, and they're going to go fast, and there are going to be children on there. And there may be some people walking with children in, in, um, you know, in strollers. I'm really worried about that. All you need is to have is one child get seriously injured or worse, and it's going to be a big problem. I really do remain concerned about that. Are there going to be signs posted that say, no bicycles, please? At, at this point, we have not proposed any such signage. Um, Might be something to consider before the fact rather than after. I'm telling you that bicycles do go through Robinson Woods. And while most of them are respectful, there's some that just come whipping right through, and there are a lot of us out there with dogs. That's our business, that we're there with dogs, and there's no restriction <coughs> on the bicycles. Uh, the, the only thing I would offer, and, and John, uh, feel free to, to chime in, we have, there are sidewalks through, throughout the town, and on occasion, I, you know, bicyclists use the sidewalk, pedestrians use the sidewalk, we've got dogs and other, you know, we've got all those people using the sidewalk. I don't generally think that uh, it's, that's a likely incident. I, certainly, as has been well discussed in many of the public meetings and hearings we've had, um, those folks that are riding uh, adults more for exercise aren't, likely at all to ride on this path no and it's really intended for for children who are going to be ride trying to ride the bicycles to school or for that primarily for that purpose it's not the children that i have the problem with it's it's people who are riding dirt bikes or or bicyclists it's just something to think about maybe posting some signs periodically that say you know no cyclists please doesn't mean you can't be on a tricycle or i don't know how you put it and the, other, and the other question that somebody raised that nobody did talk about was um, I think there may be some problem with parking at Robinson Woods and, and people who, and I don't know how you do it because I can't see striping there or anything like that. Um, not everybody's going to park at one end or the other and walk the whole path. I'm hoping maybe they'll walk half and then turn around and walk back again. But how are we going to keep that from being too clogged up around Robinson Woods? Because that's a great place to park. It's right in the middle, and it's right there, and if there are too many cars. And how do we stop people from parking along what's now no shoulder at all? Are there going to be, I mean, is everybody going to know that they're not allowed to park on Shore Road, period, anymore? I mean, I don't know. I'm posing this as questions because we, we need to think about them ahead of time rather than afterwards when... Their problems, and I don't know what the solutions are. Is parking currently allowed on Shore Road? Absolutely not. I said that the, the, the parking is, generally speaking, not an accepted practice. And I, I haven't actually seen too many people parking on Shore Road, but there are a lot of people that park in Robinson, at Robinson Woods, and and there's never been a real overload. But if you get four times as many cars trying to park there that may be a problem. And I don't know, maybe it will never be a problem, but let's think about it ahead of yeah. time. Just on the, on the biking, Barbara, um, I mean, this, this pathway is being designed for the pedestrian. It's not being designed as a multi-use path, which is a minimum no. 10 feet wide. Um, this is only five feet wide. Um, it was, my recollection is when we went through the committee planning for this, it was documented, or people testified that people that, that bike and that mountain bikers and, you know, the, the uh, spandex bikers, um, <laughs> they, they stood up here and said, we're not going to use this pathway. And um, they're going to use the roadway. This, this pathway is too narrow for bikers. I'm not saying that little children I'm not talking about little children. bike with their parents, but 
the high-speed bikers and mountain bikers, mountain bikers are in the woods anyways, but um, high-speed bikers, according to the testimony that we heard, will bike Shore Road. I will back that up as one of the spandex set. <laughs> so, so. No way. The only time I use Shore Road on the bike is when I'm with a big group on Saturday. I won't go down there because it's not safe for bikers. Um, that's my personal opinion. Yeah. I know a lot of people do it, but I won't go down there unless I'm with a big group. And I only stay on the road. So you're saying you wouldn't use the path? No, I don't, that? So you're saying you wouldn't use the path? I would not use the path. You know, I don't think Barry's concerned about the use. It's, is there a, maybe there's some extra steps that could be taken to, to specifically direct folks uh, who might think that this is okay for bikers to not use it. I mean, frankly, that seems something, I don't know that that would necessarily be needed to be on a plan now, but if it became a problem, I think the town council could just put up the signs without a site plan amendment or anything like that uh, to discourage it. I agree with you, John. In fact, I don't think there's going to be any bikers other than tricyclists and kids on training wheels. But uh, I think Barbara's only concern is maybe there's something, additional steps we could take to discourage people from using it that okay. way. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, don't, I certainly don't see that as a reason to hold this up. I'm just suggesting it, if it becomes a problem, it can be added later. Unless, Barbara, you have a, some other No, I, I mean, I'm just, I'm saying that I think it could be a problem and you don't want to have an accident to decide you have a problem and then you're going to fix the problem. I think we need to think about the problem ahead of time and how do we perhaps take steps not to have a problem. And I don't know what the solution is. I mean, to me, it might be to post a few signs that say, no serious bicyclists, please. <laughs> or if you're over seven, you can't have a bicycle on this path. I, don't know. Um, I see both sides of it. I mean, in Boulder, Colorado, where I used to live, there were many conflicts between fast bikers and pedestrians. Um, it was a much, much wider pathway and more extensive. Um, I don't see that for, or see that happening here. I would, I would hate to prescribe a speed limit before it becomes a problem. But well, if it does become a problem, I would want to see it addressed. I can tell you that on a path that's much narrower, there are bicycles. I go out in Robinson Woods on the other side where Tim Robinson's land is almost every day. And there are bicyclists that do pass, not with great frequency, but they do. And when they come, there are usually three or four or five of them together. And they're not the ones in spandex. They're the, they're the <laughs> people that like their dirt bikes that go out there. And that's fine, they have every right to do that, but this is gonna be more used than, than that is. And I worry about children on it. You know, there aren't too many children out on Tim Robinson's path in Robinson Woods. And, anyway. You all set, Barbara? Yeah. Anyone, any, any other board members have any other questions? Um, I have two more of the, the last two um, proposed conditions on the McDonald property. Back to the removable guardrail. To me, there are just far too many questions about the safety of that and who has the right to remove it and how often it would have been removed. I don't think, I don't feel comfortable that I know enough to include that in there at all, but I guess my question is, is there anything in the plan as it now exists that would preclude that being an option for that section of the guardrail because to me there are so many, it's so fraught with problems you know if it gets removed if assuming it's a safety guardrail if it gets removed and it's not replaced then we have a safety problem and is it the town's obligation to come and remove it so if somebody calls up the town and says I've got a delivery truck coming in a half hour I need you out here to remove my guardrail and they're all there are many types of issues that I see with this proposal. I would prefer to leave it out entirely and leave it for something to be discussed because it seems to me that it's not something that's otherwise precluded. And I'd appreciate your comment on that. Meaning that if we approved it with the design as is, that doesn't mean you could couldn't. still make it removable. Yes, yes. So but I have a problem to, to for show. us mandating a removable oh, guardrail exactly. because it seems to me it certainly doesn't promote any of the issues that we as a planning board are concerned about. Uh, I don't disagree with you that if you left it out that it doesn't preclude a removable section. Um, but just would want to stress that we address the issue with Mr. McDonough and 
uh, there's a, you know, from the town's perspective as to how best to address address the issue in terms of responsibility for who might be responsible for removing the guardrail as on an as-needed basis. And it, it very well may be that MDOT could say point blank, sorry, but we don't have such things and don't allow such things and wouldn't recommend such things. And that's just it's a question that we haven't had a chance to, you know, to correspond with, with uh, MDOT about at this point. But we obviously need to ask the question of them and, and hash it out a little bit further. But obviously, I don't think if you left the condition out, that it precludes that that particular removable section if it's if it seems to be a reasonable okay. approach from everyone else's perspective. I have a similar question about proposal E that the existing wooden ballards located in the right of way be removed and given to Mr. McDonough. It seems to me that's really not our business. That it, unless there's some safety issue or drainage issue or something else in our jurisdiction that has to do with the ownership of a set of property ballards, that that's not an appropriate thing to put here. As and a, I would, as a condition. As a condition. He owns it. To a, to to a, a, well, maybe he does, maybe he doesn't, if they're in the right of way. He, that's he, really he not paid, our. He paid to have them installed, and I believe there are several other instances where there might be a millstone or something to that effect that is in the right of way that the homeowner or the abutter at that location would like to have, we are, have every intention to provide the bollards back to, to Mr. McDonough, whether it's a condition of approval or not. Just it's fine with me fine. if they're given to him, but I don't see it as an appropriate condition of approval. That's it. It's acceptable to me. Okay. Do you have any issue with that? So as long as we're talking about those proposed um, potential conditions of approval, uh, I have a problem with A, which uh, proposes that we move the right of way, or, or sorry, move, remove, move the path so it abuts the right of way in order to save the Rosa Ragosas. I'm not in favor of that. I think that we should keep the path where it is as planned. But yeah, it moves it away from the road. It moves it road. farther away from the road. So the roses are between the pathway and the traffic. We'll be relocated. John, the path will be slide relocated to abut the right of way line. The back. The, back. the rear one. The away, back. away from the road. Okay. Or from the edge of pavement. Yeah. It's on one of those slides that showed. All right. That was a, I, of I the two modifications, that, that okay. moves the path farther away. Thank you. Sorry about that. Are you also? Yeah, I think we're also. Thank you. I have a question about um, safety. At Dyer Pond Road, I don't believe there's any stop sign. I think when we were walking the pathway, we were proposing how to make that section safer. And we were thinking crosswalk, stop signs. And I'm just wondering about at Dyer Pond Road, there is no stop sign. And I believe Todd Road does not also have a stop sign where Old Colony, Beach Bluff, Hillcrest, Julian all have stop signs. I'm wondering what the board or what you think about adding stop sign at those two locations. I personally don't. My prescription would be to leave things as they are now, which is to say if there's a stop sign there, let's leave it there. If, if there's not, particularly at Dyer Pond Road, uh, there's uh, plenty of sight distance for somebody to see someone coming across the path. What we have talked about doing, and I believe is included in the plan set, are what we call truncated domes, which will be located at the at the, the tip downs or the edges of the or the ends of the path at at that intersection. Uh, you know, for, for somebody who may be blind and, and need to be notified that you're getting to an intersection. But in terms of a, a stop sign, we have not proposed any at those two locations. If if the board were to feel that. That's an absolute must. Um, we can certainly pursue that, but at this point, we haven't we haven't proposed it. What what's a truncated dome? What does it look like? It, it, we call it a tactile strip. It's, it looks like a large piece of uh, braille writing. It's basically you've got a about an inch in diameter in terms of a a part of a sphere, and there are many of them across a say, It's like a rumble strip when you're going up to the toll pike out of the turnpike tolls. Just to, it's just to give somebody a sense if you step on it that you know that, hey, this is, this is a change in surface and communicates the, the, the information that you're at an intersection. Will it run across Dyer Pond Road? No, it's, no, it'll it's run on the path. Just, on the path. It'll run parallel path. to Dyer Pond but perpendicular to the path. 
Okay. So as you're walking along the path, if you didn't see, you could still feel I'm coming to the end gotcha. of, of the But while you cross Dyer Pond Road, which is feel like Dyer Pond Road. My only concern was who has the right of way? If there's no stop sign. Well, the pedestrian. The pedestrian always, <laughs> always has the right of way. Right, but there's no stop sign. So I was just wondering. I, I have a similar concern because now cars exiting Dyer Pond Road are going to have to stop. I think, was it about 10 feet short of where they currently stop to but, turn out onto shore? Well, you, you can, you can argue, argue it both ways. And I think as we, we discussed on the, uh, the site walk back in uh, May, uh, if you put the stop sign back behind the path, then the individual driving the car can't necessarily see what's coming or their view may be obscured by other things. And so then, while I've stopped at the stop sign, I'm going to get up to the road and I'm just going to pull out. And that's part of what we don't want to create. And like I said, given that the sight distance is fit, or probably 200 feet or so, I don't have an exact measurement. Uh, but it's, it's over 150 feet, and you're approaching the intersection. I think that's plenty of sight line or sight distance in order for somebody to stop if you see somebody walking across across the road as you know walking on the path. Any other questions of the board? One um, that Mr. Downs brought up, and that was um, who would assess the wildlife value of Pond Cove. I think we have a response from the town planner. Uh, I'm sure uh, for the public, too. Planning Board Member Schenkel might remember the discussion that the Comprehensive Planning Committee had about that particular wetland. But when the town was writing its comprehensive plan, we were using beginning with habitat data, which is data that's been prepared. Um, for the whole state that looks at rare animal habitats, rare bird habitats, rare plant habitats, and there was a determination made that that wetland back from the culvert has high moderate wildlife value because there's a turtle that lives there. And there's a report that the state has dating back to 1968 that there's a turtle there. And you can file the report if you're a staff member or of the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife or you're a person with special knowledge. So for the reason that that information seemed a little dated, the Comprehensive Planning Committee refused to place the plan, the report, the map, in the Comprehensive Plan. However, we were required to describe all those rare habitats. So I can attest that if you go to the state, there is actual information that, that that particular wetland has wildlife habitat value. However, the five-foot strip immediately adjacent to Shore Road, not so much wildlife habitat value. To add to what Maureen said, nobody's seen the uh, turtle since 1964. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, yes, but we do have anecdotal information from people. And, we observed broken eggshells from turtles that Mr. McDonough pointed out. So there's, I mean, I don't think we're really questioning that there's some habitat value back there. Well, if you talk to a wildlife habitat specialist at the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, they will explain that within five feet of Shore Road, it's not really a good wildlife habitat area. I mean, the, the wildlife may go there, but it's not a place where they're going to survive very long. And then I had another question that was brought up by the public and that had to do with the snow removal. And I was hoping that perhaps our director of public works could address that. Um, I've witnessed it on the sidewalks on, uh, north of Fort Williams. I've never really paid much attention to where that snow goes. I, I know it's gotten rid of, but perhaps you could address that. For the public. One of the things I understand is the town has not made the determination as to whether they're going to maintain this path in the winter, have they? Have they? Um, just your first question, and I'll respond to the chair. The Shore Road poses special challenges to us. As you noted, north of Fort Williams Park, there's a stone wall along there until you get to almost the South Portland line. We actually, when we snow blow the snow, if we have a heavy storm, we snow blow it into the gutter line of the road and then collect it. We, we try to minimize any blowing or plowing of snow onto private properties. Um, Along the guide rail sections and around Dyer Pond, again, there's you know, very little room there poses special challenges already. So we already have challenges there. I wouldn't say they're obstacles, but they're challenges to us. 
like any area where there's a guardrail. Right, so you like, remove the snow. Exactly, exactly. And I, I think our commitment or what we had intended was that, that within 48 hours of a storm, we would attempt to remove the snow from the path. Oh, yeah. Some of it would be done in the course of a storm, but the you know, majority of it would be done within 48 hours following the storm. Good, thank you. Any other questions from the board? Hearing none, I'll entertain motions. I have a motion for the board to consider findings of fact. The town of Cape Elizabeth is requesting site plan review and a resource protection permit to construct the shore road path, an off road five foot wide paved path located adjacent to Shore Road, beginning at the old entrance to Fort Williams by the pond to the town center, which requires review under Section 19.9 Site Plan Regulations and Section 19.8.3 Resource Protection Permit. The acting town engineer has recommended revisions to the plans. Plans include planting plans on private property. The project will also require a DEP Natural Resources Protection Permit and a stormwater law permit. Town Council has approved the project subject to available funding. The town has a long record of constructing roads and trails. The application substantially complies with Section 19.9 Site Plan Regulations and Section 19.8.3 Resource Protection Permit. Therefore, be it ordered that, based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the Town of Cape Elizabeth for site plan review and a resource protection permit to construct the Shore Road path, an off-road five-foot-wide paved path located adjacent to Shore Road, beginning at the old entrance to Fort Williams by the pond to the town center be approved, subject to the following conditions. One, that the plans be revised per the acting town engineer's letter dated July 14, 2010. Two, that the applicant obtain written permission for installation of plantings on private property from the property owners or that those plantings be eliminated from the approved plans. Three, the path extending from the north end of the McDonough property to the driveway will be ro relocated to abut the right-of-way line away from Shore Road in order to preserve most of the Rosa Rugosa showing, growing adjacent to the traveled surface of Shore Road. B, um, that's A of this item. B of this item, that the area between the path and the exposed ledge located south of the McDonough property, McDonough driveway, include ground cover plantings along the irregular edge of the ledge that is not part of the path surface. Um, Actually, let me go back and then that the, that the area of the path, the area between the path and the exposed ledge within the town right of way, located south of the McDonough driveway, include ground cover plantings along the irregular edge of the ledge that is not part of the path surface. C, on the southern side of the McDonough driveway, the path shall be constructed with a curb where it intersects the driveway to guide stormwater into a new catch basin connected to pipe to be installed under the driveway and outlet on the north side of the driveway to correct an existing stormwater flow and capture the increase from the path. The catch basin and pipe installation is subject to a conveyance of a drainage easement over the McDonough property to the town of Cape Elizabeth and subject to an easement from the owner of the town of uh, the McDonough property to the town of Cape Elizabeth to allow cleaning and maintenance of the culvert leading to Pond Cove. Um, then condition number four, that the applicant obtain necessary state permits, and five, that there be no construction until the above conditions have been met. Before we move on, to get to all the additional things that we need. Okay, a motion having been made and sec made do I hear a sec? Do, do we want to add an easement to the Barber property for grading? Is that for it's, it's actually referenced in uh, Oak Engineer's letter dated July 14th. It is. Okay. Well, so when you Good. incorporate that, okay. Great. Um, and then I just want to discuss how do we feel about leaving out the possibility of working with McDonald's 
on an acceptable guardrail. That we've left out any reference to the guardrail. So, so it, we're, we're, appro general. we're approving it the way it's shown on the plan. I mean, to me, a removable guardrail would still comply with that, in my opinion. If we, if we're if to be made removable, it still shows as a guardrail on the plan. But I don't really want to burden that that is a, if because frankly, if they can't make it removable and because MDOT doesn't allow that, I don't want to hold up. The plan. I know. Well, I'm thinking, what if um, what if the solution is a series of more densely planted bollards with you know two bollards that might be seven feet apart, but the others are all three feet apart. Frankly, under, and under that, preserve, that, that gets us where we want to go. We can't park there. It's a buffer, and you can access its driveway. This would that that would potentially prevent the, the applicant from having to come back to the planning board. My view is that under those circumstances, I, I think a site plan amendment would be pretty straightforward, especially with the cooperation of the owner. I mean, I, I, I'm looking at what's there, and I think it's a good plan. Um, any kind of minor tweaks like that, I mean, amendments aren't that big a deal under those circumstances, especially, again, where you're working it out with the owner. John, did you want to say something about that? I thought I saw your hand up. Maybe it was Paul. Just in terms of, I think, the mutual cooperation that Mr. McDonough and the town needs in regards to the project is, is the motivation to, to make sure this issue gets addressed and that it isn't dropped or misplaced. Um, I don't think one's going to get along without the other. And if we can't agree to be reasonable people and resolve this in some fashion, there is the thought that we've had on Monday, which we were going to pursue and, and get an answer to. But if we need to come up with a plan B, um, I think we will certainly make every effort to do so and maintain a reasonable good relationship with Mr. McDonough and address the issues and concerns that he raised to us. So, like I said, I think it's a fairly balanced need for both of us, or both groups, to, to resolve the issue. Thank you. So again, motion. There's a motion on the floor. I haven't heard a second yet. But before we, any other discussion on the motion? No, you want to second it? Whatever. I would like to add a word. Oh. I think we need to because there's nothing about it in here in the financing hasn't been raised. And I'm still concerned about that. The financing under number four. I would like to say that the applicant claimed necessary financing and state permit because they don't have financing yet, and I think we need to have that as a condition. I'm sorry if it's a town. The towns have had troubles too. But I don't. I don't. That's sort of. If they never get the financing, you never build it. It's just an, an approved plan. I just it's really. Built. That, so what's wrong with putting financing in? Like, <laughs> I really think it's a mistake not to put financing. Well, hey, I'll, I'll approach it this way. Um, it's Elaine's motion. If you're proposing an amendment. I'm proposing an amendment to add financing and state permits. That's not an amendment that I would accept. Yeah, I, and I would vote that I would not put it in there, Me too. Me, too. Why? I'm just curious. Because I think that the issue of adequate financing, um, financial capacity, is the issue that we looked at a while ago, general financial capacity. But the issue of whether at any particular point in time the, the, there is adequate capacity for them to start a project, to me, is, is not a question that we get into in construction. Um, we might require some kind of a bond in, in certain cases, but for us to say, okay, you've now raised X hundreds of thousands of dollars, you do or don't have enough money to build the project, to me, is not an appropriate decision for the planning board. Well put. I don't agree. That's, okay. That's why we have votes. <laughs> That's why we have yeah, votes. Okay. Anyway, so. You know. the, um, okay, so a motion having been made by Elaine Fowler and seconded by. Um, Eliza Quinn, any discussion on the motion on the floor? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion? All those opposed to the motion? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. I've seen a motion to adjourn. Barbara. Well, seconded by Eliza. Can we vote in favor of, Bla of Barbara's motion? <laughs> Uh, I voted.